Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Lisa Porter. I'm a professor at the University of Windsor and the executive director of WeSpark Health Institute. And I'm one of 10 of the Thrive directors. And also I'm an Amherstburg resident. I'm joined online here today with my co-host and IT guru, uh, Corey Reno, also an Amherstburg resident uh, naturalist and the vice president for Essex County Field Naturalists. Corey is also responsible for our amazing website at www.thriveamherstburg.com. And I hope all of you have had time to to sort of peruse the, the website and see how awesome it is. Uh, for those who are new to the collective or uh, haven't yet learned about Thrive, Thrive is co-chaired uh, by Lori Boyette and Richard Petty, both of whom are on the line here today. And the directors, along with those involved in the collective, as well as our new emerging student network, are really aiming to ensure that Amherstburg is a town that thrives. Uh, we do this through creating connections between best practices and good local governance. Ensuring best practices starts with education. So one of the projects that we've set our sights on is affordable housing. And today we are here to learn from two of the best, Leanne Farha and Fiona Coughlin. So uh, welcome Leanne and Fiona. It's great to have you here. We're gonna start uh, first with Leanne's presentation. Um, and then if there's any really pressing questions, you can put them in, in the chat at that time um, and I'll, I'll address them, but uh, otherwise we'll move straight in um, to Fiona's talk and then we'll have some time after to open the line for both of our speakers. And so questions from, from all of you. So feel free to use the chat and um, at the end of the talks, if you wanna put up your hand, um, maybe uh, Corey could also uh, allow the speaker so that you can speak. Um, so just I'll start off with an introduction uh, to Leanne. So um, Leanne Farha is the global director of The Shift, which is an international movement to secure the route right to housing. The Shift was launched in 2017 with the UN Office of High Commissioner for Human Rights and the United Cities and local governments and works really with multi-level uh, stakeholders around the world to uh, including several governments in North America and Europe. Leanne's work is animated by the principle that housing is a social good, not a commodity. She's developed uh, global human rights standards on the right to housing. This includes her topical reports on homelessness, the financialization of housing, informal settlements, right, uh, rights-based housing strategies, and the first UN guidelines for implementation of the right to housing. She is a central character in the award-winning documentary, Push, can't wait to see it, regarding the financing of housing. Right now, Push is screening around the world and to continue its momentum, uh, Leanne and the director, Fred, Frederick Gerton, uh, will co-host a podcast, Pushback Talks, about finance, housing, and human rights. So we're so lucky to have you here, uh, Leanne, and I'll turn uh, the mic over to you. Thanks so much, Lisa, and uh, to Thrive for inviting me here today to speak with all of you. Soon we will get to do all of this in person, which will be so much better. I spent the bulk of my morning booksing, booking second doses for me and my family, so I feel like that's where my head is in some, in some ways. Um, so yesterday, I... Um, I read in the Globe and Mail that a developer will be spending a billion dollars to purchase single family homes across Canada and will be turning those single family homes into rental accommodation and will likely be charging rents in those homes or for those homes that will be above average rents. And the developers said that they were doing this, they said, unabashedly, to make money. That this was a model that had been used and is used in the United States, and why the heck shouldn't it have come to Canada by now? And they are moving forward with this model so that they can make profits off of single family homes. This is the kind of investor activity that I've seen happening across Canada, uh, especially since the pandemic, but certainly predates the pandemic, without governments batting an eye. I'm seeing real estate investment trusts 
which use institutional money, like money from pension funds and insurance companies, to invest in apartment buildings, which they then modestly renovate, jack up rents, and threaten tenants with evictions. For the last few weeks, I've been arguing with the city of Toronto that removing people who, excuse me, are homeless, sometimes violently, from parks is a violation of human rights. These are people who don't want to go into the shelter system or have been in the shelter system and don't want to return because for them, shelters represent a place of violence, a replication of colonialism, um, often have a whole set of rules that people living in homelessness can't abide by, many sleepless nights in shelters because some people who reside in shelters sing out in the middle of the night because they're not able to access the medications and supports that they need. This population is also reluctant to go to the hotels being offered in Toronto for fear of contracting COVID and because they're not sure what will happen to them after those hotels close because the leases are only guaranteed until the end of this year. And since the beginning of the pandemic, I've been raising alarm bells with the government of Canada that 250,000 renters across the country are in arrears and are at risk of eviction and that they need protections, legal protections like rent relief and subsidies, rent freezes and long-term eviction moratoria. Many of these tenants are fearful that they will be evicted. Some are already have eviction notices against them. Some have in fact been evicted and they're really fearful about where they're gonna go. They can't afford the building next door. And will they end up living in a car, sleeping on a friend's sofa for a while, and then become one of those people in the parks that I mentioned? Sobering stuff for a country that has the 10th largest GDP in the world, for one of the most sophisticated democracies in the world, and for a country that believes it's a leader on the international stage with respect to human rights. And that's how they put themselves forward. So there's little doubt that Canada is in the midst of a housing crisis. But what I wanna to put to you today is that this housing crisis is in fact a human rights crisis. If you think about homelessness, evictions, trying to find an affordable place to live. Those experiences go to the heart of what human rights are about and why human rights are so important. If we think back to 1948, which is when the Universal Declaration of Human Rights first came in to being. Think about that date, 1948, on the heels of World War II, when the world had lost its moral compass. The Universal Declaration was crafted as a way for the world to find that compass again. And it wasn't just any old compass, it's a human rights compass that says, we are all but members of one large family. And that as part of this family, what binds us together is our mutual dignity. And living a life of homelessness, as you can well imagine, does not afford one of dignity, even if one is in a shelter. Human rights are also about human security. And after, you know, two world wars where human life and human security were at risk, 
The Universal Declaration is a reaffirmation of human security. Living with the fear that you're going to be evicted or that you might not be able to pay next month's rent and then might be evicted or served an eviction notice leaves you with a feeling of gross insecurity. Living in homelessness in a park, knowing that you might be removed at any moment and maybe even violently by police officers, leaves you in a situation of insecurity, puts you in a, in a place of insecurity. The unaffordability of housing risks dignity and human security. Think about it. If you can't afford a unit that would well, uh, well um, provide for you and your family, what do you do? You find a place that's smaller and cheaper. You find a place that's more run down and smaller. And, and all of that risks your dignity, right? Having to share bedrooms with your entire family. Having to go without food so that you can pay the rent or lowering your heating so that you can pay the rent. All of that threatens your security and your dignity. So it's clear that when you have unaffordable housing driven by profit making investors, when you have 235,000 homeless people in this country, when you have 250,000 people facing arrear, uh, in arrears, you have a human rights crisis on your hands. What I really love about human rights is what happens when you shift to that approach. You enter a whole new terrain. The individual suddenly becomes a rights holder. And it's pretty remarkable how that can shift the way in which governments interact with people suffering right to housing violations. So let's take a person living in homelessness in a camp or an encampment, I should say, in a park. So normally a person living in homelessness who's living in a park or on the streets, we could say, the corner of such and such and such and such, is viewed as at best the recipient of charity, right? Oh, the Salvation Army can, will help that person. The church will give them some food. They are viewed as a recipient of charity. At worst, they're viewed as a criminal, an encroacher, a trespasser, and the police or the city shall remove that person from the park because of their status as a criminal, an encroacher. People living in homelessness are often viewed as uh, lazy or that they have a psychosocial disability and that's why they're in homelessness. But when you recognize that homelessness is a prima facie violation of the right to housing, that it is simply, it, by prima facie, I mean there's no other way to understand it from a human rights point of view, but as a violation of the right to housing. And when you view a person living in homelessness as a rights holder, then suddenly they aren't just a recipient of charity. They aren't a criminal. They aren't lazy, but they are someone who has been deprived of the right to housing. And the failure is not theirs. The failure is government's failure. It's a complete shift. It means when a person living in homelessness pitches a tent in a park, that's a rights claim. That's a claim to the right to housing. It's an amazing, I mean, think about that. 
So if you're sitting in a government position, if you work for the city of dot, 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 and you're confronted with this horrific thing, and it is horrific, who wants people to live in parks? No one. <laughs> that is not an appropriate place for people to live, surely. It's not a dignified, secure life. But rather than shuffling people along, evicting them, treating them like crimin criminals, et cetera, your approach is, oh my gosh, I as a government employee have failed. I as a representative of the government have failed. I have to figure out how to succeed. And by succeeding, that means ensuring the right to housing for those people living in the parks. I love it. It gives, gives me chills because it is a completely different orientation. The other thing that I love about human rights is that it exposes who is accountable to whom. Governments sign and ratify international human rights treaties. The government of Canada and all of the provinces in this country have agreed, have a committed to a legal obligation to implement the right to housing. Governments are accountable to people. And that makes my job as an advocate so much easier because I know exactly who I should go to to make change, to make this a better world, to ensure access to social, affordable, social and affordable housing for those people who are in need, to ensure homelessness is addressed as quickly as possible, to ensure tenants are not evicted in the middle of a global pandemic because they can't pay their rent because of uh, an economic crisis in the country. Governments. It also means that accountability exposes to me that when I read in the Globe and Mail on a Sunday evening, that a developer is going to spend a billion dollars to purchase single family homes and convert those into unaffordable housing. I know that governments must step in because governments have to hold private actors accountable to government's human rights obligations. And so I have a direct line again, straight to government to say, hello, are you reading what's happening in your country? And what steps exactly are you taking to ensure this doesn't compromise the right to housing, this developer buying single family homes and converting them doesn't result in a deprivation of the right to housing for residents in Canada. So it, the, the way I like to think about human rights is as a way of governance, a way of making decisions. It is far more concrete than people think. People, oh, human rights, lofty goals and ambitions. No, it's very concrete. There are standards which I can talk about maybe in the Q&A because it gets a bit dry and boring, all the different sort of legal standards that attach to the right to housing. But I've told you some of the big ones, affordability and security of tenure, key standards um, that can be easily applied by governments as they hold themselves accountable to people. So I'm gonna wrap up by just telling you a little bit about the shift. So now you know why we called the shift the shift, <laughs> because there needs to be a shift away from viewing housing as a commodity toward viewing housing as a human right, away from viewing people living in homelessness as criminals or or recipients of charity toward viewing, a shift toward viewing them as human rights holders, a shift away from thinking that tenants are whining and complaining when they seek greater protections toward recognizing that they are trying to claim their human rights. That's the need, there, that's clear to me if we're going to address the local or the global housing crisis. But we also created the shift as a movement. 
because the, sh the, sh the shift or an organization is never going to make change on its own. It has to be a movement of multi-stakeholders from governments who believe that housing is a human right, and there are governments out there, particularly local governments, who want to use human rights as their frame and the roadmap ahead to grassroots movements of tenants, of people living in homelessness, to academics, to grant makers, to private sector actors, we have to come together and say, okay, this housing landscape isn't cool any longer. We don't want to live in cities with people living in homelessness or fearing that they're going to be evicted and have to live in their car. We want to live in vibrant communities where we're all in it together, where, where having a home isn't about your wealth, but it's about the idea that this is a social good that all of us should have access to. So that's why we created the shift, not just as an organization, but as a movement that's based in human rights. Thanks, I'll end there. So fabulously, Leilani. Um, that was uh, really great. And I know there's gonna be lots of questions for you. Um, just as Fiona's getting uh, ready to, to come onto the screen, I have to say that my mind was whirling because uh, even in my role as uh, for a health institute, when I think about health, I mean, it's really preventative medicine, right? It's like making sure that people have a roof over their head is just as much about medicine and healthcare. Um, and so to me, that's probably the, the biggest thing we could do for preventative medicine. Both your point about stress was just bang on. So really wonderful. I, I look forward to the question and answer. Um, and I know Fiona had a couple sort of uh, actionable items that were going to come off of this. So maybe I'll invite Fiona to the screen and I'm going to give an introduction uh, to Fiona. And I know locally, uh, Fiona uh, Coughlin really um, doesn't need much of an introduction. I think many of us have, have heard of her, if not from her. So Fiona is the Executive Director and CEO of Habitat for Humanity Windsor Essex. Fiona's lived experience in social housing drives her work with Habitat for Humanity. She believes in working collaboratively to build a better future. Her 25 years experience spans the scope of work with large government bodies to small shop community groups. She's the winner of BizX Magazine's 2019 Powerhouse Professional Award. Congratulations and well-deserved Fiona, which opens the door, uh, Fiona really opens the door to prosperity for families living in core housing need. Throughout her career, she has actively supported and driven the opening of many service operations in Ontario. In the GTA, she helped open specialized group home for seniors with developed disabilities and the Exchange, which is a unique community center built around a food bank. In Windsor, she helped the downtown missions open doors on a, its innovative new wellness center. Since 2017, Fiona has served as the executive director and CEO of Habitat for Humanity Windsor Essex. In her time with Habitat, she and her team have built affordable homes in Leamington, Windsor and Kingsville. In addition, she and her team have relaunched the Windsor Furniture Bank and opened one of the largest restores in Canada and partnered with Matthews House to open an 11 apartment two dorm refugee support center. In 2019, Fiona joined Habitat for Humanity on a build in Kenya, where she had the opportunity to learn from local leaders about the universal need for affordable housing solutions. This experience has given Fiona a deeper insight into building with sustainable resources. In 2021, the Habitat Windsor Essex team will begin a repair revolution to help those currently housed maintain their ability to stay in their homes. Fiona sits on the board of Windsor Essex Home Builder Association and the City of Windsor's Housing Advisory Committee, where she advocates for affordable housing. Her work with Habitat for Humanity is currently focused on advocating for affordable home ownership and expanding builder partnerships across Essex County in order to fulfill the Habitats for Humanity's vision of building a world where everyone has a decent place to live. That is so fabulous and it's no wonder why Fiona is a valued advisor uh, for us here at Thrive. So Fiona, I'll invite you to share your screen.
looks great. So uh, I'll let you take over, Fiona. All right, thank you so much. What an honor to, to uh, share the platform with Lilani Farha. I just, I'm a bit of a fangirl, so <laughs> um, that was just an amazing presentation and uh, just what an honor. Um, you know, and I, if you watched the PUSH documentary, I think most of us here have watched it. Um, you felt the call to action and really what I've been inspired about and many of us have is what do we do locally to make these changes happen here in Windsor, Essex. We can't all be Lilani traveling the globe and taking on huge multinational corporations, but her efforts will go nowhere uh, without people taking a stand for affordable home ownership in our own communities. Not acting now. Uh, to protect and grow affordable housing in Amherstburg is going to create a future where your own children have no option but to rent Amherstburg from external investors. So, you know, when we talk about affordable housing, um, a lot of times people picture all kinds of different types of affordable housing, but when we're talking to the town of Amherstburg, this is real, it's local, and we're talking about a future for your children. Um, I used to work at the downtown mission in Windsor and one of my favorite guests used to hitchhike from the mission uh, to Amherstburg every weekend to visit his, his mom in one of the seniors residents. And I know that when people think of people at the mission, they maybe don't think of them in the same way as their own kids and grandkids, but I can guarantee he visited his mom a lot more often than some other people that are living in Windsor. So these are your own kids. And I think that's important for people to really identify with that. Um, so um, one of the things I really wanted to bring everyone's attention to is the actions that are being taken now to uh, hold our local leadership accountable and our local leadership is actually holding themselves accountable. So in January and February of 2019, um, I represented Habitat for Humanity Windsor Essex on consultations and different workshops that were held in, in developing the Housing and Homelessness Master Plan. And that's the City of Windsor and Essex County's Housing and Homelessness Master Plan. There was 1,449 other individuals, including those with lived experience of homelessness, that all participated in developing that plan. I deposed counsel on behalf of our board of directors and staff and over 600 volunteers um, to en endorse and offer our full support of the housing and homelessness master plan. So there is a plan in place to address this challenge. So when Lilani says our governments are accountable, this plan is there. And it was unanimously supported by the city of Windsor. And then when it came to county council, I spoke to county council as well. And, um, and it was unanimously supported by county council. So there is a plan in place with actionable steps that we need to take to, uh, to, make, uh, to move the needle on housing and homelessness. Um, so based on the data that's in the Housing and Homelessness Master Plan, I project that Amherstburg uh, needs 680 affordable rental units. This is just a projection and 440 ownership units. The displaced people that we're talking about are children and seniors from Amherstburg and they're living with family and friends, couch surfing, they're living in cars and in dilapidated housing. So, um, the plan has the ambitious goal to end homelessness in our region. And again, the Housing Advisory Committee is one of the groups that is really working on that plan. Kathy Hay is on this meeting as well, and she's on that committee as well. And we hold, we work together to try and achieve the goals that are set out in that plan. Um, so we know that there's a housing crisis. We know that there's a plan in place. Uh, but what does it really mean for people in Amherstburg? Well, you can see, and this is of course city of Windsor statistics, but it's, it's very similar. You can see there's a tsunami of housing increase, price increases coming down the 401. In the past year, the average home selling price has doubled. Um, when we talk about what's an affordable house, we're talking about generally a percentage of income spent on housing, and that has to be under 30%. We're talking about homes that 
when you're looking at where will my children live in 10 years, there needs to be a house that they can actually have an option of, of buying or potentially renting. I personally advocate for ownership, um, but um, you need to have some future for your children. So what's happening, we're seeing some migration. I wanna thank Mike Moffitt um, from SBI and the Ontario Home Builders Association for providing this data. But we see the migration. So when you see the, where Toronto is, this is sort of a snapshot of the population growth in different areas of the province. There was a net zero population growth in Toronto, but you can see the population growth moving down the highway. And what that is, is a drive till you qualify migration pattern. So people in the city of Toronto and are migrating out towards Kitchener, towards London, London's migrating out. Everybody's basically driving till you qualify because the housing prices are uh, exponentially going up. We're also seeing the general population growth in Ontario. So from 2010 to 2015, the housing completions were more than the population growth, but, uh, or pardon me, the po we're keeping up with the population growth, but in, uh, in 2015 to 2020, they were not. So at the same time as population is growing, housing completions are not. So it is a bit of a supply and demand thing, but a huge part of the issue that we're all seeing is the real estate investing. And that's a huge part of what, uh, Lilani was speaking about. And when you think about housing as a human right, it's not a commodity. Um, it really changes how you think about what, when you, like I, this note came on my door and you can see I started to tear it up and then I went, oh, that might be good for my presentation. And so I didn't tear it up and I saved it for the presentation, but I didn't need to because two days later that one showed up. So, you know, it, we're seeing it across the board that real estate is an investment. And I think if you are, I know there may be some people on the call that are um, thinking about real estate investing or, or becoming a landlord or that sort of thing. I think what you need to think about is, are you adding units to the affordable housing supply? So if you're taking a, a house and you're, that is not livable and you're turning it into something that someone could live in, safe, decent and affordable, or taking a house and turning it into um, something that could be expanded or that sort of thing. If you're expanding the housing supply, then you might be helpful. Um, if you're keeping it affordable, you might be helpful. But if you're competing with uh, families for houses that you plan to, um, flip and and uh, turn into rental at a price that is unaffordable, you're not you're you're not helping the situation. Um, and a lot of as Lilani mentioned, these are generally there are local real estate investors, but a lot of time we're talking about bad actors coming on a larger scale um, from uh, a wealthier pocketbook. And so when we think about how we act in Amherstburg, you have to remember that we're not a closed economy. So we're competing, you know, it may be helpful to you to say, oh, look, my house value has gone up, but you're not a closed economy. And so people in Amherstburg are just not prepared to compete with, with the housing prices at the level they are now. Um, so I do believe passionately, and I think Lilani says it the best, um, this slide, I have it in a lot of my presentations, and this uh, is, is a quote of Lilani's, I believe there's a huge difference between housing as a commodity and gold as a commodity. Gold is not a human right, housing is. And I think that really brings it home. If you're thinking about housing as an investment opportunity, remember that you are involved in buying and selling something that is human right. An unregulated private market, this is straight off the SHIFT website, cannot be relied upon to ensure adequate housing for vulnerable groups. So what can we do? The Housing and Homelessness Master Plan identifies seven goals 
to end homelessness by 2028. And I would strongly encourage everyone on this call to read it or at least read, if you go like three pages in, there's a summary page that gives you the Coles Notes version <laughs> um, that gives you the seven goals and, and the measures that, uh, that are to be achieved. And I would strongly encourage you to read the Housing and Homelessness Master Plan. I am gonna mainly focus on goal number one, which is to sustain and expand social and affordable housing supply. So the, the measures that are in the plan is to increase the number of affordable units by 30%, to repair existing units annually, and by creating a tracking system to track private market affordable housing. So the goal of ending homelessness cannot be achieved by working alone. So my suggestion is that Thrive make a commitment to embracing the community recommendations. So it, while it is a government accountability and there is a legal obligation for our governing, governing bodies to achieve this goal, the community needs to walk hand in hand with the city. And so my recommendations would be for Thrive to support the vision and goals of the Housing and Homelessness Master Plan to share in the responsibility for the targets, to collaborate with organizations working to end poverty housing, and to advocate for changes that discourage the commodification of housing, such as home ownership supports, improved landlord regulation, and transparent real estate transactions. To take action on affordable housing, we have to increase inventory while at the same time protecting the current affordable housing stock. So one of the things that Habitat, as one of the partners in trying to achieve this goal, we are, we, I actually just came in this morning and saw a group of volunteers socially distanced in training in the lunchroom to uh, begin work on our repair revolution, which will be fully launched this fall, but we hope to have an army of uh, skilled tradespeople ready to help with repairing the affordable housing stock. Um, I would strongly encourage Aberystwyth Council and administration to adopt the following recommendations. Implement inclusionary zoning strategies to encourage development of affordable housing. And it I, it's in the plan to designate surplus municipal lands for affordable housing. But I would also add some caution there that you need to know who you're getting into bed with. And you have to ensure that there's strong enforceable legal protections and conditions in place to ensure that those builds stay affordable. So it's very easy for certain bad actors to position themselves as affordable housing um, to manipulate the system. Um, so you really need to make sure that what, uh, what you're putting in place protects that um, affordable housing. There's different uh, ways that there can be development fees waived. I know for Habitat for Humanity in the city of Windsor, all of our development fees are now waived, which is wonderful. Um, we're also seeing, and this is uh, something that came from the Ontario Home Builders Association, is that there's a prediction that there will be a shift in the commercial real estate market. So while we're seeing a boom in the housing real estate market, the commercial market may be affected by the COVID uh, reality of work from home and shop from home. So we may see a lesser need for commercial real estate. And I think our cities and towns need to be prepared for rezoning and repurposing commercial lands. Even in their plans, there may be lands that are designated as commercial for a time pre-COVID where commercial lands were more necessary. Um, and also there's buildings and areas uh, that may sit vacant. And so really taking some action on that area would be something that I would recommend. Um, sorry. So um, Habitat for Humanity Canada has received $32 million in funding commitment from the federal government. What this translates to is about $60,000 per home that we build. So my goal, is to bring as much of that funding as possible to Windsor-Essex. Um, so we have 
some houses that we're building in Ford City that are receiving some of that funding. But uh, once that build is completed, we hope to bring it to another build, ideally, possibly in Amherstburg, possibly in other areas. Basically, we build where we have land. <laughs> so I'm trying to build as much as, as possible. And uh, council and administration and Thrive can help us achieve that goal by helping us secure land. Um, the land, the, this build would have to achieve the affordability litmus test of no more than 30% of household income to go to mortgage payments and property tax taxes. And we would implement a tiered equity split to ensure the houses maintained affordable for at least 20 years. So we have a full buyback if somebody decides to, uh, to resell their habitat home, we have first right of refusal on that. So that's how we keep the houses affordable. Since opening in 1994, Habitat for Humanity, Windsor, Essex has built 67 houses and over 288 individuals have been permanently housed. 184 of these individuals are children. This is one of the families we've served. So when you're picturing affordable housing in Amherstburg, remember these families, this is affordable housing. So we're standing with Amherstburg on the front line of battle. We're in a battle against poverty and a battle to retain home ownership in our community. We have conducted a fulsome study and we know that for one, every $1 invested in our housing, there's a $4 return to the community. These benefits are realized through homeowner property taxes, decreased reliance on costly city services and subsidies, but Habitat's only one of many solutions to the housing crisis. This is why partnership is paramount in our strategy to expand our impact. When you're thinking about what type of resident could be a Habitat a homeowner, it has to be someone in need of suitable housing. So that we, they have to prove core housing need. And this is where we look at is more than 30% of their income going to the property, but also are they living in dilapidated housing or is the housing smaller than the family's needs? So we sometimes hear a lot of talk about tiny homes or things like that. And when we look at the fact that we're serving sometimes families of five, six, seven, um, tiny homes actually would be considered substandard housing and still core housing needs. So I often say to people, when you look at tiny homes, if you're talking about building small apartments for seniors, you can definitely fit more by building up instead of across. The other side of the challenge with tiny homes is that um, basically you're building the equivalent slightly fancier trailers. So we have to make sure that what we're building is achieving the goal of safe, decent, affordable housing. So I'm not saying no to tiny homes. I'm just saying there's different ways to approach it. Some of the innovations that we're looking at, we're looking at 3D printing of housing. We're looking at modular housing and things like that. But I would say um, we need to build houses that are that meet the needs of the size of families that are, are moving out of Toronto. And one of the statistics that came out of uh, the research from Ontario Home Builders Association is the average age of the person migrating down the 401 out of Toronto is one to four. The next most populous age is 30 to 35. So what that is, is people who came from living in condos and those sorts of things, and they start to grow their families. And now they need a single family home. And so now they're moving down the 401 and they're literally driving till they qualify. So when you're talking about real estate investment, remember you're competing against a family with an infant and driving that house price. So the next thing that we look at uh, at Habitat is are they willing to partner with Habitat? Everybody of course puts in 500 hours of volunteer work uh, to get their Habitat home and they have to be able to make affordable mortgage payments. And so at Habitat, uh, it, rather than doing rent geared to income, we do a mortgage geared to income because it allows that person to actually own the house and build equity. And I think that's the key is when you talk about what's happening to the land is who's owning that land, who's owning 
So when cities are selling off land to a developer, they lose control. And so if we can put the control back in the family, in the homeowner's hands or the resident's hands, that is a way to offer dignity. It's one way, um, but it's something to be aware of. So by 2028, our goal, um, we're going to have launched the repair revolution. We're going to have 35 more houses built, fingers and toes crossed, that's five houses a year. And ideally we're going to bring in another $1,500,000 through federal funding uh, through Habitat Canada. So one of the things that Richard Petty asked when we were planning this presentation, I was talking about how the funding works for affordable housing and that a lot of it comes through the city of Windsor, like from the province to the city of Windsor, and then it's distributed out. And Richard said, well, how do we get more of that money into Amherstburg? <laughs> and uh, a lot of the times the different federal funding programs are tied to different, um, different programs. So there's ways that, that people of Amherstburg could advocate to get that money brought to Amherstburg. And that would be not that you get an envelope of funding, but that people tap into the funding that is available. So there are homeowner uh, down payment assistant programs that uh, people can look into, but there's also rent assistance that is administered through the city of Windsor. So if you are a landlord and you're thinking about how can you make sure that you're meeting the needs of affordable housing, uh, find out if you can uh, get involved with uh, making sure that your units are rented at an affordable rate and then tap into the, the rent assistance programs that are available through the city of Windsor. And of course, you can partner with nonprofit organizations. But again, I would say know who you're partnering with, make sure that they're at, um, good actors on the scale that you, you, they've got a reputation of actually doing what they say they're going to do. Um, and uh, so I would say coordinate efforts, uh, remove barriers to development. And again, I would just strongly keep going back to make sure you know who's the developer and what are their, what are their plans. Um, so for us to tie into this funding, the projects must have the support of another level of government. Partners are required to contribute, but it doesn't have to be monetary. So uh, just to conclude, this is the house I showed earlier. It's not an Amherstburg house. It's actually Leamington. And in Leamington, this house, and I love this house because it's got the most Canadian graffiti I've ever seen. Sorry, this house was boring. <laughs> you can even hear the sorry. Um, but this house was one that was on the city's books for some time. Um, and it was obviously a problem on the street and no one was living in it. And so the city gave it to Habitat for a dollar and we uh, turned it into that and housed an Indigenous family um, in partnership with an Indigenous family who's now a happy homeowner and uh, transformed that. So we can do this all over the county. Um, but again, those are my recommendations and my spiel on affordable housing. I hope I offered insight, not just into what Habitat can do, but what you can do as Thrive as well. Are there any questions? Excellent. Thank you, Fiona. <clears throat> so while well, people are um, putting, they can either put things into the chat or feel free to raise your hand. Um, one question I had uh, that could be for either, either of you, really, um, I think another level of problem right now is the fact that um, we're seeing materials for building just go through the roof. And, you know, is there anything that holds accountability um, sort of at that level? You know, like the supplies needed, it's unrealistic how, how high these things have climbed. So there's a number of different groups that are working on this. And I should mention that the Ontario Real Estate Association actually recommended transparent bidding on housing. Um, the Windsor-Essex Home Builders Association and the Ontario Home Builders Association is advocating on that issue specifically regarding the, um, the uh, materials component. So I think as Lilani mentioned is, is it's not one group, it's a movement. And we have to all, if, we, if we're all operating from that perspective of housing is a human right, 
within the scope of our different worlds, we can make some movements. So in the scope of members of Windsor Essex Home Builders Association, they're out there fighting to advocate for uh, affordable materials. In the scope of the Ontario Real Estate uh, Agents Board, they have, it was actually, I think 2017, they recommended to the province that we shift to transparent bidding on housing. And uh, the province is still thinking about it. And that's coming from the Real Estate Board because the lack of transparency in the bidding is, is also driving the housing prices up. So when you're talking about somebody who's driving till they qualify and they come to Amherstburg, they're, they, they're literally coming in going, how much over asking should I offer? And um, you know, at least with open and transparent bidding, people have a chance to try and, and, and compete and match properly. Um, how that would affect like, the affordable housing market. The Toronto guy who's got a little bit more money may actually still win, but it does lower the comps in the neighborhood a little bit. And um, for us, for Habitat, part of, as of our being an ownership model, it's tied to um, the fair market value. So we have to get appraisals on our houses. And so ours would be considered affordable if they're 10% less than fair market value. Or, or at the average, sorry, the average selling price, but we have to transfer them at fair market value. So if, if the comps in the neighborhood are astronomical, mm -hmm. it drives the price up even of a habitat home. Yeah. So that's, that's the challenge. Great. Um, I'm wondering if you could unshare your screen, then we could see, I just can't oh, see if there's any hands up. No, no, no problem. Hold on. I think you you close the presentation. You just got to unshare the screen. Perfect. Better? There we go. Yeah, that's great. Now I can see every everybody here. Um, so we have a question in the chat uh, for I guess this is for Habitat specific. Um, how do they get a lot to build on? Usually, do they go to the developers to donate the lot? Um, and then lots also cost a lot. So. So our, if we're talking about a habitat home, we've had donated land in different places. Um, we partner with different cities. So the Leamington one, uh, there are different towns that have um, an inventory of land that is um, surplus land. Again, I would be very careful about who you give the surplus land. <laughs> <laughs> too. Um, but you can always put conditions on those things. So when we got the house in Leamington, uh, the condition was that the house that was existing had to be, we got it for a dollar. The conditions that were tied to it for the city was that it had to be taken down because it was unsafe. Um, I think it was within about a year. And then we had to have a house built on it within a year. And so that way, the town was able to ensure that it wasn't just, you know, sometimes what happens if it's put on the open market, and they can't just give it away unless it's already been on auction. That's just part of the I think it's the Planning Act. But the, there is an inventory of lands that have been auctioned and are now on various city books. And if they were to put those out on the open market, what could happen is that a bad actor could buy them and just turn them into slum housing or a bad actor could buy them and just leave them vacant um, and just let them, uh, you know, buy it on spec. So by doing it with an organization like Habitat or another one where they say, we will give you this for a dollar, but you have to achieve these benchmarks and you have to prove that there's, they can put in those components to make sure that what happens with that land um, is what the, achieves the goal of, of the city and the housing and homelessness master plan. So that would be one way. We have had donations from private donors. There's one that we're having fun building on in Port City because um, it was one that someone had struggled to build on a long time ago. They had bought it to build commercial and then it was rezoned to residential and then they didn't get the residential. And there's a lot of challenges with that property. Usually whatever habitat gets, there's something, <laughs> there's something, <laughs> there's a reason we get it. So this one has like, we have to deal with drainage issues and parking issues and all of this, but that's, that's the fun of it. Um, so, uh, and, and in some cases, habitat does, uh, does buy the, buy the land as well, but hopefully not. <laughs> 
Mark, did that answer your question or did you have a follow up on that? No, that, that pretty much answers because that's the that's the big dilemma that, you know, with the cost of building and, and the land is not far behind on trying to build social housing. It just it's costs have gone crazy. Yeah, and I think what we put together for the city of Windsor, because um, we we're asking for some lots there too, is that we looked at the fact that um, basically for every house that Habitat builds, we've and we've got the data to prove it. There's a $175,000 return to the community in um, savings on subsidies, savings on social services, and then also building in the neighborhood um, and the ta property taxes that come in. So we, we put it together where we calculated right out the math of what the return would be for each house. So when you're comparing, well, we could get this dollar amount for the land, but we don't know what's going to happen to it. And we don't know if it's going to be something good or we can save this dollar amount. We can ca cause these social goods. Um, and so for each time we would basically, we would put a proposal together. Yes, Lori just wrote, I have it at home, uplifts the whole neighborhood as well. Yes, the street, and actually the street where we built on in um, Leamington, that one house, the lady who lived in the house next door, she she came out and uh, and she was just so excited to see neighbors coming in again and and that sort of thing. And you started to see people down the street uh, doing different things to kind of take care of their neighborhood and be part of the community as well. So, but again, you want to make sure that there's strings attached. That's what I would say. So maybe you know am from I, am I am I covering that well I, I i don't know about the legal side of it and i think lilani would know better as far as the strings that need to be attached well i was going to kind of direct that also to um Le leilani like so the you know what we've he heard from fiona is really it takes a village right so many different people working together and so i wonder even from um the shift uh, um you know, do you have sort of an, an indication that sort of making a social justice um, appeal, uh, is it is it getting to all of the levels that it has to? Like, do you see people that like, to me, I think this would be an easy sell, right? But do you, do you see it from all levels, real estate, construction? Um, I mean, if the question is, um, do we have buy-in from all, uh, the different actors uh, in terms of recognizing housing as a social good and then not just recognizing that but in fact acting on it in a way um, I would say no um, and it's not just I want to be clear about making a social justice argument there's a big difference between a social justice argument and a human rights argument the human rights argument is is one that is based in law and legal obligations. And a social justice argument is based in something else. It's based in some sense of, yeah, maybe, you know, some sense of, uh, uh, of how the world should be um, without the legal underpinning. And that legal underpinning is very important. And, and um, I maybe didn't emphasize it enough in my presentation, but, um, and, and so, I don't think we have enough uh, recognition of housing as a human right based in law as we need. And I don't see governments flexing their, um, their muscles enough in that regard to say, you know, like local government could be saying to other levels of government and to developers in their backyard, look, Housing is a human right. I, as local government, have a legal obligation to implement housing as a human right. If I allow you to do X, Y, Z, that will undermine the right to housing, and I will fall afoul of my human rights obligations, of my legal obligations. Governments could, could view human rights as a stick um, or even a carrot, but 
it's not there that's i don't see that happening and i certainly don't see a lot of movement in the developer sector or in the certainly none in the investor sector um, if we want to distinguish between developers and investors which we should because they're not always the same sometimes they are um so there's a lot of work to be done there when you look at where investor money comes from there's real opportunity i mean pension funds in this country pension funds often teachers pension funds for example used to well they didn't invest in this country necessarily although they did to some degree, but they used to invest in social and cooperative housing, sometimes in other countries, for example. And, and we need pension funds to um, pull their heads up a little bit and look around at what's happening in the country, thanks to their money, this country and other countries, thanks to their money. They are helping to promote a model um, and, you know, Fiona put up that slide of mine. I think Fiona speaks <laughs> incredibly articulately about these issues and didn't, doesn't need any of my slides, but any or my words, actually. But in any event, I mean, if, if pension funds just thought for a moment how they're shooting themselves and pensioners in the foot, right? Like, a, by contributing to the investment in housing, they're contributing to the increased cost of housing. Who, who lives in this housing? Pensioners. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, um, it's a false investment in a way because they're, they might be growing their pension fund only for pensioners to have to spend the bulk of their pension money on rent when they're renters. So, so there's, a, there's so much ground that needs to be covered here, so much more work and so many more actors that need to be brought to the table. I will say, even domestically, but internationally, I am starting to hear about um, real estate investment trusts that are set up for the social good. Um, so really to, to drive um, the building or investment in how, how social housing, for example, or deeply affordable housing. Um, so, uh, you know, there are a couple of developers in, um, in and around Canada and you know, besides Habitat for Humanity, I mean, that, that, that obviously an entity that is only doing social good. Um, but there are, you know, some mainstream developers that are on board. Um, Daniels is one in Toronto, for example, that's pretty well known. Um, but it's just not enough. I mean, when you look at the depth of the crisis, I, I honestly, I, sometimes I'm just shocked. It's like, I can throw out all these ridiculous numbers, 250,000 renters in, in arrears. That's a huge number. 235,000 people homeless on in, you know, in any given year in Canada. That, it's actually, that's, that's a huge number, but it's also a solvable number, you know? I, I just, I can't believe that we're not seeing more action on the part of different levels of government and on, on on housing as a crisis i think the pandemic has helped to some degree i mean there are a lot of cities that are just like whoa wait a second this is very bad and um are i think it's been a bit of an alarm um but whether we have enough intergovernmental cohesion and coherence. That's an, another good question. I mean, the federal government announced in September, I think it was, that that you know they're committed to ending homelessness in the country. They didn't give a date, and they said chronic homelessness. They didn't give an exact date, but they were like new emergency. You know, we're going to do this. But when I've talked to cities, they weren't consulted about it. They weren't told exactly how it is that the cities that are on the front line of that particular crisis, how, how they were going to be provided with the resources to do it. So I'm in conversation with the city of Toronto and they're saying to me, uh, well, no, we can't end chronic homelessness. We can't. So anyway, I'll, I'm, I'm going on at length. I'll leave my comments there. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, there's two hands up, so we'll go to them. Uh, Sharon, uh, you have your hand up? Uh, yes, I'm uh, with the Society of St. Vincent Paul in Amherstburg, and uh, we deal with, you know, on people who are going through difficult times. And um, 
I know that there's a section of homes in Amherstburg that are administered by Windsor and Essex County Housing, and they're not in good con condition. And I'm wondering, is there a possibility for um, Habitat to work with them to um, kind of fix up these homes and, and correct the problems with them? Or do you get your fix up uh, from another source? Like how do you, how do you determine you, whose house you're fixing up? Well, I know that you would have, like specifically Jim Steele would know the, more than I do about the Windsor, uh, uh, the Windsor housing that's there. But I know that I've been working with the uh, Windsor community housing and we're, we have plans in the works to, with our repair revolution that is coming, um, we have plans in the work to partner with them to get repairs happening on um, all of the properties. And uh, so we would be partnering on that. There's been, I think it's $180 million earmarked towards repairing the properties across Windsor and Essex County. That would be in the coffers of the Windsor Community Housing Corporation. And so our goal would be to partner. We would um, we would actually have a fee for service model. We would probably be cheaper than most skilled trades out there, but we would be using volunteers and people who are looking for training to come and work on those, on those units. And then we would build community housing and then the money that would come in for pay <laughs> to pay for the repairs would actually be used to build houses. So we have this really cool plan coming and that's why it's a circular program. All of habitats, it's, it's sort of an interesting way that we've had their, our model sustainably because there's always a reinvestment component and all of the money is restricted towards building houses. So, um, so ideally what would happen is government money that was earmarked to repair social housing would then become money that Habitat uses to build more social housing. That would, that's the revolution. That's what we're working on. It will probably la launch this fall. I'm, I'm hoping to hire my, uh, my leader for that program this week. <laughs> Would that also include um, asbestos remediation? Because I believe there's asbestos in some of the... Yeah, we would probably, that would have to be something that we, our team would not be able to do that piece. But so what would happen is community housing would look at what needs to be done on those units and bring in the uh, appropriate services to remediate um, asbestos and those sorts of things. A lot of times too with asbestos, you're sometimes better off not to disturb it. Um, so it always depends on the situation. Um, but that would be beyond the scope of my volunteers. But once that's out of the way and somebody's made a determination on that, what we would do is come in and, and make sure that they're uh, livable, safe, decent, and affordable. Okay, thank you. That's great, great point, Sharon. Seems like some low hanging fruit really, right? Yeah. Like, you know, get to the repairs first and thanks for all you do. Uh, um, Mike? Yeah, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Michael Hoppy. I currently, I'm a Windsorite. I currently live in San Francisco, uh, California. Um, so there's, there's a lot of interesting things that I see. And I'm just going to give an observation, um, just what I've seen in the Bay Area. Um, but also what I've seen around the world. Um, I've had the privilege of living in Athens and uh, a little bit of Turkey. And, um, and there's kind of two dichotomies that I've come to witness. Um, so the first one is like, let's pick on the Bay Area. Um, San Francisco and Oakland, Oakland, especially you got two different things happening. Um, the first one, San Francisco is a very transient city. So you got populations coming from all over the country and they kind of converge on the city. Um, and, and that one's really tough for the city to deal with. They build what's called homeless navigation centers. Um, there are these large centers that people can come to, um, but they kind of, they, in their eyes, they have to sign away their rights a little bit. Uh, and that's um, back to the first presentation, the conditions they don't like living in is, is they kind of end up signing off their freedom in exchange for having shelter. Um, so it's a little bit of a challenge, but Oakland's a little bit different. Oakland is a natural born populational issue where you have people who are literally priced out of their communities, but they lived here their whole lives and, and, and they're not going anywhere. And, and so what ends up happening is you have mass populations that live in parks. Um, and and, and it's, it's certainly not by choice. And it's, it's, and it's not always because they were priced out. A, a lot of it is mental health issues. And 
So the homeless crisis um, is, is not just because they ran out of money, it's because they have a mental health crisis and, and these people cannot get support on their own. They need help. Um, and, and it's very challenging to see because you see two dichotomies of a population, one uh, that is very wealthy and affluent um, and another one that's ultimately stuck. Um, so building housing is, is, is not the kind of kit and caboodle. Um, there's a huge mental health issue that needs to be addressed as well. My last point is when I lived in Athens, that was when the refugee crisis from Syria was happening. And you saw boatloads of people coming in. Um, either they would come in through the Mediterranean, um, which were the you know, less fortunate people came in through that route. And then other ones had buses and those were the wealthy Syrians that came in through buses um, and they would get dropped off in Athens and, and nobody had anywhere to go. Don't think that they were just getting into hotels and things like this. Um, they would, entire families would live in parks um, as they continued on to Germany or wherever else. But I noticed something really special and whole groups of people, vagabonds, you will, from England and everywhere else came and they started taking over the derelict buildings and they started setting up community centers outside of um, the authorities, if you will, like our city councils and our governments. And, and, and people had places and homes to go because this is the thing that really shocks me about how cities treat homelessness is people just need to get out of the rain. And, and the governments are more comfortable with people being in the rain and living in tents and boxes than they are with giving them shelter in some apparently risky derelict building. But because those people were of sound mind, the Syrian refugees, they went and sheltered in derelict buildings because it was better to be in those buildings than it was to be in the rain. And, and I noticed that here in San Francisco too, you have entire groups of very affluent people who talk about homelessness while there's people sleeping outside on the street at the same time. Our issue, the long-term solution may be government, but we just need to get people off the streets. We need to give them somewhere to go to get out of the rain. And that's the biggest crisis and the biggest heartbreak I see. When, when I was in Turkey, it's a Muslim nation, it's secular, but Muslim. And they have a saying that if you're Muslim, you, it's your duty to help other Muslim people. Now it's not widespread or happening as much as I think they want to happen, but the community takes each other in. And, and, and so we as Canadians and North Americans, what we've largely have done is we, we are very comfortable walking past homeless people, you know, but we don't think, are we, could we ourselves as individuals provide the solution? Looking at government for this solution is not going to happen overnight, maybe in 10 years. But until then, these poor people are going to starve and, and, and they're going to fall into disparity of mental health illness. And, uh, and, and you know, to be frank, we just walk past them, waiting for somebody else to fix it. And, and so that's my observations. I, I largely think this is something the community must solve. And uh, if we wait for government to do it, we'll be having this exact same conversation for the next 10 years. I think uh, the, the, what would be really good is, is if people took a few, it took some time maybe after this presentation to read the housing and homelessness master plan that the city of Windsor put out, at least local residents. Uh, one of the amazing things is they've got, they've got some great points. I know I really focused on goal number one, but they have uh, some great uh, points addressing um, housing with supports and on addressing um, different uh, communities in need of housing. But it all, they also offer a spectrum of how we're going to implement this. And only one piece of it is the government piece. Now, I agree 100% with Leilani that the housing as a human right is what gives us the teeth. And I think the fact that council uh, unanimously adopted and county council unanimously adopted this uh, housing and homelessness master plan, that means Amherstburg Council has everything they need to act on all of the recommendations in there. And knowing that housing is a human rights, Amherstburg Council and Amherstburg administration have the teeth to implement what they need to do to get to it to, to 
move on this on this item. So again, I would address everybody to look at the housing and homelessness master plan. And then the other spokes on there was the housing advisory committee, community groups uh, and social services and community members at large all have to be partners in implementing this. So I noticed Lilani also has uh, something to add. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I, I also seen kind of two points to this. I mean, three, three points really. I mean, obviously uh, Leilani and Fiona probably have learned a lot from other, other parts of the world and, and take that perspective uh, very well. But it seemed to me that there's two pieces. One is the acute piece, uh, getting people off the streets right away, but then also sort of longer term solutions with, with housing. Um, Leilani? Thanks. And thanks, Mike, for um, giving some international examples. I've been to all those places that you've talked about, and I might beg to differ on some of the um, details, but um, I just wanted to pick up a point um, um, around mental health and uh, homelessness, because there's a way in which one could easily say, well, you know, mental health issues make it very difficult for someone to uh, live in housing without supports. And, you know, so it's sort of not surprising then without supports that they might end up being homeless. And um, I want us to understand the way human rights um, situates homelessness. So, and I want when people walk away from this webinar to think about this, when you see the next time you see someone living in homelessness, so when we walk by someone living in homelessness, what should go through our head is, oh, right, that's the failure of my government to do what it's supposed to do. Not that person has a psychosocial disability or is addicted to an opioid or whatever, no. What, you, what I want us to, to understand is that what it is, is the failure of a government to do what it's supposed to do. So where the person has a psychosocial disability, what a government should do is they should ensure access to adequate housing with social supports. And the failure to provide that ends up being the violation. So the person who has a mental health issue and is living in homelessness has had their right violated because the government has failed to ensure they have access to adequate housing with the necessary supports. And the country in the world, the only country in the world that has reduced homelessness and is set to genuinely solve it. And, and we can one can think about what genuinely solving homelessness requires is Finland. And the only reason that Finland has been able to successfully lower rates of homelessness and is set to end it is because they've taken a human rights approach, which includes not just ensuring that people living in homelessness have access to adequate housing with social supports if they need them for as long as they may need them, but also Finland has decided to look at the structural causes of homelessness and address them. So unlike in this country where the government makes a grand announcement at federal level, we're gonna end chronic homelessness. Oh no, but we're not gonna insist that social assistance rates across the country be raised. And no, we're not gonna ensure that access to adequate housing with supports is available, no. But we're going to make this announcement and we're going to float money to cities and hope that they know what to do. Bypassing provinces, which I don't disagree with, but never demanding that government set social assistance rates above poverty line, above the poverty line. In fact, there isn't a jurisdiction except Newfoundland, which is now a bankrupt province. There isn't a jurisdiction in this country where social assistance rates are, are even near the poverty line. They're all about 50% below the poverty line. So in Finland, they said, well, we believe one of the reasons people fall, are falling into homelessness is because they don't have adequate um, social assistance. 
And so they ensured that people had access to adequate social assistance. And with, with the breathing down their neck of institutional investors, they took some actions to keep them at bay. For example, I think Finland is one of the few jurisdictions that doesn't give a tax break to these big real estate investment trusts. And without giving that tax, so they didn't prevent real estate investment trusts from existing. They just didn't give them a tax break. And without the tax break, they haven't been very active gobbling up affordable housing. So, so just to say, to go back to Mike's um, comments, to say that, that if you took a human rights approach to housing, you wouldn't have people living in homelessness, period. You just wouldn't because it's an immediate obligation. You certainly wouldn't have navigation centers, which is something that I think the city of Toronto, for example, has, has looked at. They are, I've been to them. They're like, for those of you who don't know, it's like going to Cirque du Soleil, but instead of there being an interesting thing to watch, what you see are rows and rows and rows of um, bunk beds, and this is supposed to be some solution to um, homelessness. And just to say that the mayor of Oakland, um, I don't, I can't say that she has embraced the human right to housing, but she's much more friendly to the human right to housing than is the mayor of San Francisco. And so you see then a difference in policy approach between the two. It's actually not totally true that the homeless population in San Francisco is uh, migrants. It, the bulk of the homeless population up and down the, the corridor in California are actually people from California. Um, and they are, in fact, I met several people who were trying, who were working people. I met a guy who was working at an animation studio and he was living in homelessness. I went, met a woman who was, that was in Oakland. I met a woman in Oakland who was who had been who was working at a medical clinic um, but had been priced out of her apartment by a big institutional investor so um yeah i'll leave my comments there we're running short of time i see six minutes left i i think that's a, an amazing point that that the people that are homeless in windsor as well i remember working at the downtown mission and the constant demand for bag lunches and i remember when i started there going what are the bag lunches for oh well so people could take lunch to work so the residents the, the the guests of the downtown mission are working people sometimes and not all of them but a good number so there's a lot of judgment that people make and assumptions that people make about people in housing need um, that are incorrect Great points. Um, yeah, I should say I, I lived uh, in California from 2000 to 2004 um, as a postdoc. And I can remember I had my kids there. My rent was $2,800 a month US for a one bedroom apartment in La Jolla. Um, it was insane. I just couldn't. Yeah, there's no way people then getting out your first home was just if you didn't come from money, it was virtually impossible to get up onto the, you know, to get started, which is one of the big reasons why we came back to Canada. So it's heartbreaking uh, to see us following the same trend. Um, so tons of great uh, discussion, lots of people online. I understand that this, uh, the talks are going to be uh, kept uh, on our um, YouTube channel, on Thrive uh, Amherstburg's U YouTube channel. Um, and uh, I would just love it if we could have uh, Leilani and, and Fiona to come back uh, at a later date, because I know so many people um, are going to absorb this information and have other uh, questions and uh, comments. So um, with that, I think we're, I'm mindful always to end on time. So I wanna thank uh, both of our speakers uh, for really giving us a lot to think about uh, so many fabulous points. Um, I cannot wait uh, to um, dig into to some of this and continue learning. So thank you both for your time. Um, and uh, thanks for everybody for being on the line here today as well. And so thank you. And uh, have a, re a great rest of your day, everyone. Thanks. And thanks, Lisa, for moderating. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Thrive, for inviting us. Bye, everyone.